friends, uh, welcome back to NRI Samai. This is Sri Hari. We have uh, Anu Vaichanathan and uh, Sri Kant Kosharal Kota with us. Sri Kant will be doing an interview. Uh, Sri Kant, uh, you want to go ahead? Yes. Thank you, Sri Hari. Uh, friends, uh, welcome back to NRI Samai. And uh, this is your today's host, Sri Kant Kosharal Kota. And now, friends, uh, today we have a wonderful, incredible person on our show. And uh, she's a true definition of uh, passion reloaded. And uh, she's Anu Vaidyanathan, a PhD in electrical engineering, faculty at IIT and IIM, and first Iron Man of India, which involves a 10 kilometer swim, a 420 kilometer bike ride, and 84.4 kilometers run. And very few of us can give true light to our vision and mission at a time when girls of our age, of our age, uh, plan to quit and uh, uh, quit the sport and settle down in life, Anu has been uh, riding high in both uh, sports and academics. And uh, Anu Vaidyanathan is also a CEO of uh, Fat and Mark company. And I'm sure my friends, her passion inspires everyone who knows her uh, to not accept the status quo and make uh, things happen. And uh, we have uh, Anu Vaidyanathan today live on air. Uh, this is NRI Samai, live from Los Angeles. And uh, just, just to uh, quickly tell, let you know, my friends, uh, Anu strictly does not answer questions on training schedules uh, as each and every individual is different. And it is not recommended for her to prescribe any training schedule. So kindly, kindly refrain uh, from, uh, uh, from asking any of these uh, questions. And uh, friends, if you have questions, please, if you are in the United States, call on to this number, 323-410-0162. And anywhere else in the world, uh, try the Skype uh, that is there on uh, nrisamai.com. So we have uh, Anu live uh, right now with us, friends. And uh, Anu, welcome to NRI Samai. Good to see you on the show today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be on. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to a great show. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anu. And Anu, they say uh, humans and wheel cannot be patented, but seeing you and listening about you for a while now, I, I feel there is a need for, to take an exception. So if you were to introduce yourself, how do you do that? What do you say? Uh, well, actually, I am a pretty ordinary person. I've uh, you know, had a very uh, idyllic childhood. I grew up in, uh, well, I was born in Delhi, and then I grew up in Bangalore uh, you know, most of my life, until 16 years old. And then I think... Um, you know, I've had a, a life where I've seen a lot of different places, and that's my good fortune. Uh, 17 to 18, I was in Chennai, and 18 onwards, you know, I went back to Bangalore, then I, I came over to the United States. I studied there for, you know, six years. Uh, I worked for a while, then I came back, I started this business, um, you know, got into sport um, very seriously only after moving back. And, and so I would say I'm a pretty run-of-the-mill person, nothing, uh, nothing super fabulous in any way. So I'm actually embarrassed by that question. Uh, but on the other hand, I think um, really, as I was telling uh, telling a few people yeah. early on, I think that um, you know, I think we become who we are based on who we run into. I think uh, that's right. sort of true for everybody. And I think I would definitely describe myself as being incredibly fortunate to have the family I have, or have it, you know, for having met the friends I have met because they sort of opened my life up to so many different avenues that I could not have imagined on my own. So I would definitely say that I'm, I'm very fortunate and, and, and incredibly privileged and, and very aware of that. I'm very aware of that. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Childhood, see the roots are uh, all uh, uh, when uh, you're, uh, you're a kid and mm -hmm. uh, parents and uh, close uh, siblings nurture our, our mindset. And I remember my dad, who, who gave me a table tennis bat when I was very young, and uh, he, he gave me a direction. I was also a table tennis player, but not as, as good as you were in, in your sport, but still, I, I was fortunate enough. My dad uh, gave me a table tennis bat and asked me to go and then uh, try out. And uh, it, it, it set a direction for me. I was wondering what in your childhood is, is something that gave you a direction, uh, thinking beyond, out of the box. You seem like an out of the box person. You know, honestly, when I was trying to compile uh, about you, it's like uh, I, I gave up after some time thinking that you're, just, you're in so many things. Well, what's the fun in compiling? Let me talk to Anu and then get something out of it. So just trying to understand what is that, uh, who has set direction for you in your childhood? We have Hari who has asked this question from Sweden as well. 
See, I would say that my childhood was just like you know any other childhood when Bangalore was not as polluted and as terrible as it is today. I think um, you know we lived in a very small little house in a in a beautiful neighborhood lined with trees. You know, every evening we would run around and have have all kinds of fun until 7:30 or till our mom shouted at us to come home and finish our homework. And you know, we we were. Uh, Pretty much very very normal kids and and also school I really hated any form of physical activity you know outside my playtime you know if uh, if they put me in a marching band or they said you know uh, run five miles or you know throw a basketball I would make all kinds of faces and pretend that I was you know uh, I had some tropical disease of some sort but I think basically uh, what gave me direction in my own life was just watching my parents because they were incredibly hardworking people you know they were. Uh, Working very hard to make ends meet. Uh, my mom is something of a, you know, she's she's a bit rebellious in her own way. Although she's, you know, like all other moms, she's very understated. She doesn't go around saying, you know, what she's about to do, or she doesn't blog about it. She's not on Facebook. You know, she doesn't waste a lot of internet real estate. But in her own way, she had taken a stand in her life to start a business when uh, when actually she had my brother. You know, so she was a a young mother with two infant children, and she had decided to start a business and. So that meant for my parents, and my father was helping her. So that meant for my parents very, very long nights, you know, and uh, very, very early mornings. And so in seeing that discipline, um, I never thought about it uh, sort of consciously. I never thought mom is waking up at five and making me breakfast, or they're going to bed so late. I never thought about it consciously, but that sort of imbibed in me what I wanted to be. You know, I just wanted to be uh, somebody that they would be proud of and. And I always wanted to impress my parents. Always, even till today, they are the only people that that I really ever want to sort of get past in terms of you know opinion. You know, I, I, everything else is, is is great and and fabulous as it comes along. But I think uh, just watching them work through the days sort of set my my own path to school. You know, I was very competitive in school. Um, uh, I was a total nerd. I loved my books. Um, I had very thick glasses. I was a very uh, <laughs> nice and chubby child, and you know, I, I was somebody who who never took uh, anything except my studies very seriously, you know, and my playtime, of course, my my two hours in the evening nobody could have interrupted. So I think basically uh, there wasn't any external force sort of um, guiding my hand. And the other thing is my parents never pressurized us to do anything. In fact, my mom would have been just as thrilled if I'd gotten a commerce degree as I. <laughs> As I got an energy, she never said not a single day that you have to get this degree, you have to get married by this age, you have to have these these things in your life for you to make me proud of you. Never, not not to this day, right? And I think um, actually that lack of pressure probably created the drive. And yes. because it was it was all self motivation. It was not something that came from outside. You know, no disciplinary action. In fact, my parents would argue with my teachers for me, not against me. You know, so that that's something that. You know, I find it is more and more rare as you go on. And definitely, when I moved to Chennai, I found that you know the culture there was in, was 180 degrees different from Bangalore. You know, people were very authoritarian. Their kids were in tuition from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., uh, which is all fine. You know, when you are trying to get into the IITs or something. But before that, it's really incredible pressure on a child. You know, so you're not really letting them develop the way they want to develop. And I would really say that nothing, nothing specifically was ever dictated to me, and I think free will is, is really the answer. I was allowed to have as much of it as I could, and I think that's that's what made me choose whatever I chose as I grew older. Right, right, absolutely. Because taking off the pressure, that is something uh, the, uh, uh, to talk about. Because uh, pressure is something that that makes a a, a kid uh, do something else rather than uh, what he's interested in. I think uh, your parents set, set uh, standards and not pressurizing, and then uh, being happy with whatever they get. So that I think uh, the the strong roots and uh, your mom being uh, uh, very independent, and then you said she started the company, and uh, she, um, yeah, that's I think uh, I can I can get uh, uh, the gist of uh, your childhood that uh, definitely set a direction for you. Right. And uh, let me ask you this: CEO, a PhD in electrical engineering, a faculty in IIT, IIM, all this at a very young age. You pretty much broken every single stereotype that's out there. Why was it then important for you to compete in the Ironman contest? What is this? Uh, is this totally out of, out of the box? Well, um, I'd like to clarify one thing for all the listeners. Uh, Patent Mask is a very small organic company, so definitely to have an image of a 
you know, a five-acre plot with glass windows, they're all mistaken. Um, a CEO is actually a code name for Chief Pune. I do everything from opening the door to <laughs> occasionally mopping the floors when the, when the lady that was supposed to do it doesn't show up. So we're a very small firm. That being said, over, um, over the last decade, we've grown at a pace that I'm very proud of. I think um, mostly because we are self-made, we've never had uh, external funding. We've pretty much bared, you know, played by our own rules and we've sort of followed our own moves through this. So I'm, I'm very proud of all that my company is, but you know, I don't want to create the impression that we are some you know, glass, uh, glass and gilt uh, studded chamber. That being said, um, academically, I think we were, I mean, it was clear to every middle class kid in India that uh, you know, your education is sort of your meal ticket. It's not something that you can take lightly. And, and you know, my, as I said, my parents never said I should become an engineer or whatever, but Bangalore at that time uh, that I was growing up, uh, was very much into IT and programming was such a big thing, you know. And even right. even from eighth or ninth standard, I would you know go and take extra classes to learn programming because I loved programming. Programming was the love of my life, you know. It was everything that I wanted to do, you know, before before school and after school. And and um, you know, I also lost a bit of weight thanks you know thanks to that crazy obsession. <laughs> So there was no way the auto driver would pick me up on time, right? So my mom said, okay, I'll just buy you a bike. You can go from school to computer classes, which was, you know, that was like climbing the Everest at that time because I hated physical activity, but whatever, you know. So uh, yeah. the thing is, um, yeah, I mean, I I don't think, I mean, when I'm doing whatever I'm doing in my life, it's not that I ever think to myself, okay, this year I'm going to do this and next year I'm going to do that. It's never, you know. Many people seem to perceive that my life is a bit more dramatic than it is. It's not. It's a very boring, you know, day-to-day uh, -day existence that that I live, and and I'm and I'm perfectly happy with it because I think if you think about things like personal excellence or you know just being really great at your job, I think there is an element of repetition that should not bore you. You know, I think you must be committed to having some element of repetition, and if that bores you, then you're in trouble because you know a lot right. of really great people. Um, you know, who do very well in their fields of work, only do so because they've had so many thousands of hours uh, spent on that job. You know, right. it's, it's, uh, it's the same whether you're breaking a piece of granite or you're, you know, you're an engineer. I think it's the same. You have to spend that much amount of time at a skill. You know, and um, and so I think, I mean, as far as my education and my company goes, it was mostly to, you know, it was a, it was a series of events that led me to, you know, pick whatever I picked also very influenced by the atmosphere at the time. Um, right. And as far as the sport goes, I think, you know, there was no epiphany in my life that, okay, today I have to do the Ironman. There was no such epiphany. It was a very gradual build up to, um, you know, even doing a half marathon. Then, you know, thinking, okay, I've done 21 kilometers. Now I think I'm going to try to run 24, you know, in two weeks or three weeks from now, just to see how I, how I go. And it was very, very gradual built over, you know, more than five or six years, you know, and, and and finally, when it ultimate, you know, um, sort of came to a triathlon and said, okay, I'm going to do a triathlon. Also there, I didn't start with, a, with an Ironman. I started with smaller races. I just got the feel of things. And then I thought, all right, now I'm, I'm ready to try. But unfortunately, what had happened at that time was I had moved home. And, and that, in that lies the bigger adventure. Because if I had been in the United States and I was training there, things would have been automatically easy. You know? and, and that, that would have been a different story. Uh, but right. this was a totally different story, and and so you know, and so it goes. And so since then, I've I've just continued and doing you know to do a little bit better, a little bit better, and and uh, yeah, and that's and I'm here now. And that's what it. There's no uh, nothing serious. Yeah, as you said, uh, uh, you've started off uh, big or small, but definitely you've you've made it uh, very big. I know that's guaranteed. And uh, as uh, uh, I've I was just trying to understand. Um, you set yourself the target of winning the Ironman contest for, uh, by 2015. At the rate at which you're progressing, there's no doubt that you'd be a serious contender for the title. Uh, what would Anu Vaidyanathan do after being crowned an Ironman? I want to think after the after uh, being crowned an Ironman. Or, so I was just wondering, what what would uh, Anu do after that? See, the thing is. Um Dreams and goals are different things, right? I mean, that is my dream to sort of reach that, uh, mm. reach that title. Now, if it takes three years or five years or six years, I'm not going to set myself on a on a pedestal or look at myself uh, less because of it, right? I mean, I'm not going to pump my ego up because I thought, okay, I reached there by this date or 
feel worse because I didn't, you know, whatever. So I, I feel that I'm uh, very even keel, you know, I'm not somebody who gets very, uh, very worked up by things. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, there is no, um, it, it's sort of not a full stop in my life or even a semicolon. I think this, whatever I, I get to, as close as the title that I get to, that would just be something that's like a bookend in my life, right? And after that, we'll start some other, hopefully, nice chapters. And, you know, every every uh, person dreams of having a family and, and you know, uh, yeah. In in our case, hopefully, tormenting the child because both of both the parents will be totally nuts. But you know, whatever. Like in, in all seriousness, I think there are uh, sort of. Um, um, I mean, I have I have very uh, you know normal outlook on on how things might progress, and I'm pretty serious about academia in some ways. And I I really do think that um, besides uh, teaching being uh, a very fulfilling thing, uh, because it's a very personal thing. Actually, I think teachers are some teachers, at least, uh, and I'm in that category, are there because of partially it's also very self-gratifying. You feel, oh, I'm doing such a good thing. You know, I, I feel so enlivened by the company that I'm in. My students are amazing. You know, they, you know, and, and this is the kind of sharp mindset that I want to be around. So I think there is a there is a self-gratification component to teaching, but then there is also the other component of wanting to make a real mark and in, in uh, you know furthering the subjects that are of interest to me. And and I think yeah, sure. I mean after. Not that there's a before and after, but even now, you know, during and, you know, whenever <laughs> I decide to have a kid or whatever, and I just settle down and have my feet in one place. I think, um, you know, I, I just have normal, normal goals. Um, and hopefully if I can motivate one or two people along the way, then, you know, even better. My life would be yeah, definitely better. doing that in an era where uh, Facebook and Twitter is, is, is definitely a revolution. And I'm sure not one or two, you're motivating a lot of people. And I've, I've had intense pressure for a lot of my friends saying that you got to get Anu Vaidyanathan on the show. And that itself uh, says that people are uh, people love to listen to you. So it's, it's, it's guaranteed that uh, there are a few people around uh, who's, who's definitely, uh, maybe they'll be motivating their kids or whatever it is, but it, that, that's definitely going to transform very soon. So... Friends, uh, this is NRI Samai live from Los Angeles, and uh, we have an incredible person today, friends, Anu Vaidyanathan, for who I, I know a lot of you know about her, and uh, she is uh, the first Ironman of India, which involves a 10-kilometer swim, 420-kilometer uh, bicycle ride, and an 84.4-kilometer run. So uh, we are in conversation with uh, Anu Vaidyanathan right now. So, uh, Anu, I, I just wanted to, uh, a lot of for the benefit of our listeners, uh, most of them don't know about the sport. Uh, I, I was also uh, in that category a few days back. Uh, explain a little bit about what is triathlon, what is the sport about, and uh, uh, how can people uh, really get more information on this? That will be really helpful. Um, well, a triathlon is a three-sport event. It's a swim, bike, run. Um, there are different distances, you know, like even running has different distances. There's a 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon, ultra marathon. So in a similar vein, uh, triathlon also has different distances, uh, a sprint distance, an Olympic distance, a half Ironman, then an Ironman. Actually, the distances you described are in the Ultraman, which is a three-day stage race. An Ironman is a 3.8-kilometer swim, 180 on the bike, and 42 on the run. And I think that 42.2 is be a stickler. Um, and I think um, basically these are in a, in a class of uh, endurance events that, you know, they've come about uh, only, I mean, well, recently compared to the rest of sports history, sporting history, so to speak. And, and uh, the, the myth is that they came about when uh, people got tired of only running and wanted to cross train and then they decided to put these three sports together and see how far they could go. And the first few, uh, you know, major, you know, series races were held, and you know, the ultra, uh, the ultimate culmination of all these races used to be at Hawaii, and mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's sort of the a very brief, you know, two sentence history of the sport. But obviously, what is more interesting about the sport is that uh, it really uh, was very different from any other sport because it, it it required a human being to be really good in three different disciplines and not just one. And uh, some argue that, okay, it's much more difficult to be an elite runner than a somewhat average Ironman athlete, and I actually agree with that. I think it is much more difficult to be an elite runner than a somewhat average Ironman athlete. But what, what I do bring to the table uh, in this discussion is that one must consider that you have to train as much or somewhat close to as much as an elite marathoner trains to 
uh, you know, to sort of be any good and how you periodize that or how you phase that in, given that you have two other disciplines, the swim and the bike to think about, now that, that makes it interesting. And I think, I mean, sure, I mean, we are not running as much as the elite marathoners, but I think, um, you know, we are trying to run as much as we can. It sort of makes it very interesting when you have two other disciplines to take care of. So that being said, um, the resources are all all over the internet. Uh, you know, nowadays I think it's it's a little bit overdone. There's a race in every country, and people don't tell you. Um, see, I think uh, one thing I would like to sort of say is that with any endurance sport, I think people should pay uh, due respect to the process. It's not something that you know you should pick up as a fad and try to do within a few months just because you know you mm. thought it was a good thing. Because that's not a good idea. You know, right. you do have to pay attention to the fact that your body is going to be putting itself through six or more hours of, of really hard effort, you know, and, and that's yes. something that we really have to think about. Uh, you know, I mean, if it's a half an hour for an Ironman, you know, upwards of 11 hours. So I think um, even for a marathon, you know, nowadays the Mumbai Marathon is so full of people and it's, it's amazing to see and it's amazing to be a part of, but it does make me wonder when people, you know, uh, think about four-week running programs or, you know, six weeks to a marathon or, you know, 52 weeks. Or 52 weeks to an Ironman, yeah, I think it's, it's reasonable. If you're trying to finish, it's great. But but definitely pay due attention to the process and, and what it takes on your body. And I think as far as um, tips and resources, I think the best tips or resources I could give to people living in India would be that you sort of get into a group uh, that runs together, swims together, bikes together, so that you have somebody to look out, I mean, somebody that can look out for you because there obviously the, the dynamic is very different. And if you're living in the United States, I think you have... Uh, you know, you have the problem of plenty actually. You have so many different bike rides, so many different bike groups. You can swim at a local YMCA. You know, you don't right. have to get to the most expensive pool. Uh, and, and for all women and men, I think it's, it's important that they have some kind of a strength routine just so that, you know, things don't get too out of hand, especially for women because we are more prone to osteoporosis as, as we go along. So uh, no matter where you are in your athletic progression, I think the only thing that people need to pay uh, due attention to as far as endurance events goes, you have to pay respect to the process. If you are planning on running a marathon, you must have run at least, you know, three hours in training, right? At least once. Right. Otherwise, right. There, you know, there is no way your body knows what it's in for. And now, there are people that do, I, there are many different ways to do an Ironman. There is a way where you can walk and finish and do something and get to the finish line, or you can really do it like a race, you know, which is, sort of, you know, you never stop and you're very serious about getting from point A to point B in the shortest amount of time possible. And, and depending on what your goals are, um, you know, you, you, should, you should sort of structure your program based on that, I think. Mm. So, right. um, yeah, I'm not sure if that helps, but that's, that's my suggestion, people trying to get into it. Right, right. Excellent piece of information, excellent piece of information. I think a lot of our listeners would, uh, would get an insight of, uh, of, the, of the process that is involved in this, for sure. So uh, we have uh, Karthik from uh, Karthik Dhinne from IIT Karakpur. Uh, mm -hmm. His question to you, uh, Anu, is uh, according to you, what essential support does a sportsman need during his training stage? Um, well, um, look, this is a very common sense thing, right? I think any sportsman needs um, just the essential atmosphere to train in, right? If I were uh, training for a run race, then I would need the roads to train on. If I'm training for a 40 kilometer bike ride, then I need at least 10 kilometers of road to be open so that I can do laps and sort of get my training in. Even if it means four laps, I need a 10 kilometer stretch or a five, something like this, where I'm not, you know, I'm sure that I'm not going to be hit by um, a cow or a truck or a rampant lorry or whatever, whatever the case may be. Right. And I think for swimming, same thing. You have to have access to pools, and if, even if you're paying five rupees to get in, they should let you swim for 45 minutes. I think, um, unfortunately, uh, there are two, two uh, sort of aspects to this. I think, to me, essentially, I'm somebody who is in a very off-beach sport. I'm not someone who uh, is in a, in a mainstream sport. I'm not someone who is in a, in a sport that can be played on a campus of some sort. You know, I'm not a swimmer. Uh, I'm not just a badminton player who can have a nice um, stadium and, and practice. And there are some wonderful, uh, wonderful badminton courts in Hyderabad. Um, you know, Gachi Boli being one of them. I'm not a tennis player. Again, you know, you, you, I don't have the luxury of being in a confined area and getting my training done except for the swimming, right? The yeah. swimming, if I have a pool, all, all that's uh, fine and dandy. But I think 
Right. And, and I've spoken to a lot of long course runners even in our own country and um, I believe that uh, his, you know, second uh, sort of thing is I believe that it's not the job of a sportsman to worry about infrastructure problems, you know, because a lot of great sportsmen have actually been born out of adversity. You know, if, if I had, um, you know, the the golden path, you know, I had the best trainers, the best, the best therapists, the best coaches, the best massage people, you know, the best uh, mental psychology people, which is like some new, uh, you know, uh, set of people that are coming around, which I don't know, I find that debatable. I think whatever it is, if I had the best of everything, then, you know, what am I achieving on my own? That is something that I've always worried about, you know. Good and I, while I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I think some athletes are born when they have really great facilities and, and it takes them on. They think, okay, I've made the world championships, next I'm going to come first, you know. So people that are not in adverse situations are also fantastic athletes. And then there are athletes that have adverse situations that can still be fantastic athletes. So I think um, the essential support of sportsmen needs, of course. I mean, that, that's clear. It's, it's just training ambience, you know. Um, and I think uh, the second part, and this is a favorite question for almost everybody I speak to, is does the government do anything about it? Well, it's not my job to answer that question. I think it's obvious for everybody to see um, what the reality is, and I don't have to answer that. I think it's an oxymoron. But I also think that, um, you know, let's, let's not make excuses for why we can't do something, especially if we have the, at least we have the willpower, you know. At the very least, if you have the willpower to run, and you want to run 10 kilometers, I, I think you can do it, you know, no matter where you are. There are people that have run through, you know, uh, bomb-strewn streets in Germany, you know, some of the greatest marathoners have come out of some, you know, incredibly tough situations, you know, so I think, um, do we have the support in India? I'm not sure, and I, I don't think there's a polite answer to that question, but I do think um, that, you know, it's up to us to make our, to make our path, and if you are privileged enough, then, hey, you know, don't complain, you know, just go and, go and grab it, you know. And I, I am definitely not one for complaining. I, I don't think that's that <laughs> Truly, truly, yeah. It's, it's like we have, um, I just got a message from Vivek Mandava from Seattle. And uh, his question to you, Anu, is I'm very fascinated by how you started your journey. Do you closely relate the life choices that you have made to a triathlon, the kind of preparation that is required, the kind of priority that should be given to each activity juggling between various roles and responsibilities and being damn good at it? Um, well, actually, I... See, the thing is, I don't like to dramatize things to that extent where I'm saying that my entire life is like a triathlon. No, by no means is that true, but I think that being a triathlete or being an athlete of any sort has brought with it a mental fortitude that I cannot find by being just a, an engineer or a CEO or any, anything else that I might be from now on. I will never get um, the kind of mental discipline and the physical discipline that I've had to cultivate, at, you know, in being an athlete. And I think to answer his question, um, definitely the sport has taught me a lot about tenacity. You know, if you if you break at every question you get, or you break, you know, thinking, okay, I know I have to run at five in the morning, but I know I have to work till midnight. What the hell am I going to do? You know, I've, I face the situation more than more than once and I still do. Even even today I, I face the same issues. You know, I, I still don't know. I'm not guaranteed that at five o'clock the roads are going to be free, you know. So I, I still face all these issues but I think that uh, for me sport has brought with it um, this kind of freedom that I cannot find in anything else, you know, because I know that my entire outcome is, is based on my effort. You know, I am not dependent on anyone. Um, I don't have to be a favorite amongst my lecturers. My clients don't have to like me, you know, it, it's all me. Whatever I do, whatever I put in, that's what I will get out. And I think that kind of uh, pure, uh, you know, feeling is something that's becoming more and more precious these days. You know, we don't have it because our lives are so complicated. We, you right. know, we have so many people to answer to. And if you're in India, you know, you have hundreds of people ringing your bell before, you know, 8 a.m., which is nuts. And so it's, it's something where, you know, almost it's cultivated in me the sense of solitude and it's cemented that to an extent where I, I love it. I would never ever trade um, the, uh, the freedom or the mental freedom that sport has brought uh, with, with anything else in the world. So I think, yeah, it has definitely made me a lot more disciplined and it has definitely made me a lot more mentally tenacious. So, um, I, 
I, I don't know if that answers this question, but that's what sport brings to my life. And it has definitely made me um, a lot thinner, uh, so that's another uh, benefit. Right, right, right. Uh, I hope, uh, Vivek, you got your answer there. And uh, we have uh, Raghu Nandagiri from Michigan. And uh, his question to you, Anu, is I've uh, got interested about Anu Vaithinathan and her uh, sport uh, f uh, after, uh, after the post in NRS Samai. And um, uh, his question is, uh, seems like Anu's GPS coordinates are consistently changing. Does the sport require a person to move from country to country. What's uh, what's what's about uh, the sport and people moving from place to place? Well, uh, yes, I do travel a lot, um, and I'm glad that someone is talking me. But <laughs> I do travel a lot, uh, and uh, I'm surprised too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always very worried about people asking me where I'm based. You know, where are you last week? Where are you this week? I mean, I you know, big deal, right? I mean, I wouldn't say this to my acquaintances, so why would I, you know. But anyway, uh, more seriously, I do travel a lot. Um, and I think uh, that's a function of, um, you know, we don't have a lot of triathlons in India. I think that's obvious by now. But, um, you know, I also need to sometimes get in consistent blocks of training, which I'm not able to do, um, you know, when I'm home. And I think, especially when I'm working on, you know, periods of uh, swim focus training or, you know, in 2010, I had an injury that no physiotherapist in India could, could help me with because I'm not a cricketer and I didn't have access to these, um, you know, extraordinary resources. So I think, um, yeah, there have been periods when I've been away from home. And um, is that a function of my life? Uh, only when only when I'm, you know, setting out to achieve a, a specific milestone. Otherwise, I'm a, I'm a pretty home-bound person. I love being at home. I, you know, my idea of Friday fun is, just cooking and, you know, I don't know, maybe occasionally a movie. I don't have a TV, so uh, TV has never been an issue. But, you know, I'm not someone who, who enjoys the up and go, up and go kind of life. I'm, you know, I think a lot of my experiences are based around, um, you know, one place where I can remember the trees, I can remember the roads, you know, I can remember the cows or the dogs if you're running in my backyard for that matter. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, or, or even in Cabin Park, you know, there used to be this one gentleman who would run Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'd run, you know, almost every day. And, and we'd say hello to each other. And these are small things. I mean, it's, it's not that he was my best friend or I ever knew him beyond the point of saying hello. But, you know, these are all routines that sort of make your day, you know, make my day. I'm not saying it's the true of everybody else because there are all kinds of triathletes. Some of them, you know, I don't think they have a stable home. Some others are very stable. They stay in one place, and and I think they are the most more successful athletes because I think they definitely work on strength to strength. Because traveling in itself can become an addictive thing. You know, you might one might start to think that unless I am on the road and doing so much, I am I'm not doing enough. You know, and that has happened to me too. So I think, um, but but in all honesty, uh, yes, I do travel a lot, and uh, and yeah, it is it is a function of, of trying to get better in the sport, definitely, and and work. So. If he's been tracking me in the last uh, two weeks, it's because I've been <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's one question, right? GPS coordinates moving. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, I what is I, this question? I think he'll take down this guy's email address and his photograph, so I know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little cautious about him, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, and then his references is good, like you're saying Canada, uh, he was referring to Canada triathlon event and uh, a lot of uh, things. He's, 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 he sent me a big question which is from starting 2007, the event that you participated in, and then 2008, 2009, Ironman or Ultraman. He's put in a lot of things, but I tried getting the gist of it and then asking you. Okay. See, the thing is, I, I often end up training in countries where I have some kind of subsidy. And, uh, you know, Canada is much cheaper to train in than the U.S., for example. Mm -hmm. New Zealand and Australia, are, well, Australia is very expensive, but New Zealand is a little bit more economical than most places in the world, right? But yeah. you have to love the lifestyle. If you're going to New Zealand to watch TV and eat French fries, then very bad. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, truly living on an island can drive you crazy and, and the weather there can definitely drive you crazy if you let it. But I loved it, you know, because for me riding was right outside the door. I could get out my door, I could ride for hours. I could, you know, uh, ride to a trail, you know, that was amongst a few hills, foothills, and I could, you know, run for hours. So really it's a function of what you want to achieve, you know, and right. that sort of determines your, your place to be. And, and in the earlier years I would 
commute to Chennai every weekend to get my long drives in because I needed the humidity for one of my races. So, yeah, I mean, even within India, I, I travel quite a bit. Um, it's not all, all you know, plain and diamond. So. Okay. And then uh, you, you've, you've been talking about uh, uh, just sitting and then eating french fries. I don't know if this question yeah. makes a, a, good, good, a good level of sense, but there's, there's one uh, person from, uh, his name is Jana from Germany, and uh, mm -hmm. how do you deal with, how to deal with procrastination? Uh, I'm always putting things off, how to reduce it? I, I don't know what kind of suggestion, but still, I, I had to ask you. <laughs> See, when I first saw her question, I think she posted that on my uh, Facebook too, but when I first saw her question, I uh, I didn't know what to say, so I said, uh, don't procrastinate, I mean, isn't it as simple as that? <laughs> and then my husband said, uh, don't be don't be rude. I said, no, no, I'm not being rude. Uh, you know, I, I, that's what I truly mean. And he said, no, but that sounds very rude. I said, okay. Then I said, all right, um, if I were to seriously think about it, suppose, you know, I had, uh, you know, one of my friends or my students ask me this question, how would I answer it? I'd say that, Look, one of the things that is definitely happening today is that we have so many things to sort of um, uh, take our attention away from us. You know, we've got Facebook and Twitter, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I, I do stay active on it because I am traveling as much as I am, and I really want to be connected in some way to some people, not all people, but some people definitely they make me smile on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they say something, or they admire a photograph, or they say some something nice, or they ask me a specific question, or... You know, so I, I definitely draw on the energy of the crowd. Um, I, I, I will never uh, deny that. But I think that there are too many things that are taking our attention away. You know, today we cannot sit down and think about one thing for a long time unless we make a conscious effort to do so. You know, the phone is always ringing. Uh, we've got data plans on our phone. We have to get back to that person who's messaged us on Facebook right now because otherwise, obviously, world peace is at stake. You know, so I think the problem really is that, you know, you should understand why... Uh, you know, you feel as bored or as or as unmotivated as you do. It's because your brain is constantly turning over things. Um, you know, at at a pace at which your your parents or our grandparents didn't have the necessity to do. You know, and I think uh, procrastination for a lot of people is essentially not really laziness. It's just the time that they need to actually uh, unwind and come back to sort of being in a space where they can actually do the things that they set out to do. So I think if if you're ever feeling like procrastinating maybe the best way to overcome uh, that phase or whatever is to get, just get started on whatever you were thinking of doing, right? I mean, if you thought, okay, today I'm going to run for half an hour, and it's 7.30 in the evening, you've come back from work, you've watched your two episodes of Friends, and now you have to, you know, you know it's 7.30, the sun is dimming, whatever. Just go out and tell yourself, all right, I'm going to run for one minute, two minutes. I'm going to see how I feel. That's all you really need. You need to start whatever you set out to do. The other thing um, to beat procrastination is to, in the morning, write down what your ideal day would look like today. And this takes a lot of discipline because many people will find any excuse under the sun to never write anything in their own life, you know, because we are, right. we are not writing handwritten letters anymore. So we are, again, we are not thinking through things anymore. But um, I think one of the most effective tools I have used in the past is just in the morning to write down today, my ideal day would be A, B, C, D, E. If I got these three, you know, four things done, it would be a five-star day. If I got these three things done, it would be a four-star day. That's still okay. Or, or whatever it is. I just write it down. And it takes two minutes. You know, it doesn't take a half an hour. You know, right. you don't, and the time you're sitting in a bus or sitting in your car or at that light, you can definitely, you know, jot it down on a post-it note, you know, which I've also done in the past. So I think um, if, if you just find the time to live mindfully, I think a lot of the stress will go away on its own. And you'll find that there is really no need to procrastinate. And there is another uh, reason why I found a lot of kids that I've taught, for example, putting off their projects or putting off their homework, and that is, you know, they don't quite feel connected with the life they are living. You know, you might be making a million dollars, you might be in high rise, but you, you, don't, you just don't connect to that life, you know, because hmm. you don't have time to sit down and eat a meal. Uh, constantly the TV is on, um, you know, constantly your boss is bugging you on the phone. Maybe hmm. that's not the life you, you bargain for. I mean, and then whatever price it comes with, let me tell you, it's not it's not good enough. So I think, uh, you know, and, and everybody's individual psyche is different, right? It's the same like training. I, I really cannot, um, you know, tell Jana, Jana this is the one uh, solution to your procrastination. But, you know, what I'm trying to sort of talk through is the reasons why you might be procrastinating, you know, and I can only talk from my experience. I really, I don't know 
uh, why she is you know, in particular procrastinating or you know, who, whoever else is in particular procrastinating. But you know, these are all reasons why this might happen. You know? And um, I think, I mean, a part of it also has to do with how goal-driven you are or how motivated you are. You know, that thing, always, always give yourself the benefit of doubt that you are motivated and you are totally worth it and that, you know, that it's never that, you know, only um, people that are doing Ultraman or have Facebook pages are, are worth it, right? I mean, every individual story is, is totally worth it and they just have to believe that for themselves. And, and I think once they sort of talk themselves through whatever it is they're going through and mindfully proudly write it out, like for example, my husband is now forcing me to you know, not sit at the computer when we eat and he's been doing that for the last... Uh, you know, two and a half months, and it's made a huge difference because I want to have a real conversation with him. You know, it's not that I right. want to be talking to my husband after he comes home from work while I'm checking my Facebook page. You know, that's kind of I'm not really listening to him, so I'm not doing any any uh, justice to the relationship, uh, nor am I right. doing any justice to my digestion. So there is no, you know. So I think as far as procrastination goes, yeah, definitely um, it, it will take a bit of time and thinking and writing to really find out what, what is making you put things off. And, and once you do, hey, you know. All the best, and I hope she'll write me back and, and tell me how it goes. <laughs> or if it's totally BS, she can tell me that too. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I value your husband's suggestion because personally I was thinking whether you should ask this question or not. Yeah, it's like being rude sometimes. Yeah, it might be a valid question, and then we just ignore it, thinking, oh, why, what a question is this? But then uh, I definitely respect your husband's suggestion, and also I respect mm -hmm. Jenna's question here. Yeah. <laughs> so, either way, it's a good lear learning experience. Yeah, and, no, uh, I Rude, so I, I apologize to her if I sounded rude. I just thought, you know, um, because to me that's the answer. This is why I don't give out training programs either, you know, because to me the answer is one way and, and that needs not be everybody's answer, you know, and, and I do definitely have to respect that. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah as I said, reflect like the sentiments of uh, people asking and it, it's, uh, it's definitely applicable to us and in our summer as well. Every question is worth it. <laughs> And uh, you mentioned about uh, injuries and uh, definitely this intense program that you've uh, you've taken to get to the triathlon and then uh, we have talked about we have talked about Iron Man. I shouldn't say Iron. I should say Iron. Otherwise, they'll be bashed upon. Maybe Iron no, Man. Or... I say Illinois, so it's fine. You're in good company. Go ahead. <laughs> so and then the Ultraman or whatever it is. So. Injuries are part of the whole, um, uh, it's, it's a gamble here, so uh, what, what's it all about, how, uh, how intense is it and uh, how, what, what can, you also mentioned about a few, few of your injuries earlier in a conversa conversation, so can we go over that a little bit? Um? See, again, it, it depends on what, what you're doing the sport for, you know, if, if I'm doing an Ironman to finish, then I would train and race very differently, I mean, I would, you know, I would only train as much as my life allowed it. I wouldn't be moving, you know, to Canada for a month or New Zealand for a month to train, you know. So I would definitely, um, definitely say that, you know, injuries for me are a part of my life only because I've set my goals at what I've set them, you know. And, and I think, um, and I've come to, you know, accept that it's a part of the process, you know. It's not something that you can totally avoid, but you can ameliorate it uh, with a good strength program or being, you uh, being careful with your stretching. I hate stretching. I still hate stretching. I mean, I've, I've hated stretching for as long as I've been running, so or even doing triathlon. So I think, um, but what I hate or love doesn't matter. You know, at the end of the day, if my body has to be healthy, uh, I have to get rid of that ego saying, oh, I have to spend the next 20 minutes stretching. How stupid and boring is this? I, I can't be like that because if I am, then I'm doing myself a disservice. So um, I have had to really uh, reevaluate, um, you know, the support system that that the athletes have at their disposal everywhere else in the world you know at one point before the ultraman you know i was um, uh, you know i had a chiropractor helping me out because there was some certain issue with my posture in 2010 when i uh, finally submitted my dissertation i fell off my bike because i hadn't been sleeping and you know mm. also uh, you know i had not been out on my bike for a long time i thought all right, I've just submitted this document, even though I haven't slept for a while, I'm just going to go on a bike ride. And I promptly fell down at a, at a traffic signal and, and that screwed up my left leg a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think for me, injuries are a part of my life. And, and luckily for me, I haven't had one that is fatal or, or life-threatening. So I think um, that way I'm very fortunate. So I, I don't really dwell on, on you know, the, yes, they put me out of action for about, uh, you know, six or 
five and a half months because you know I didn't have the requisite support. I also moved back home you know, immediately after submitting my thesis because I wanted to teach. But you know, it just put me out of action for a while. Uh, but other than that, I don't think it was a, a career-threatening injury. You know, it was not something that I required surgery for or had any issues around. So oh, that way, I'm very good. fortunate. And, uh, and whatever has happened after that, and now, you know, specifically now we have uh, one more uh, thing that we're working on also with my left leg. Um, we're just working through it. You know, it's not something that I fear or worry about. I think I've, I've come to accept it as this is part of my life because these are my goals. You know, if I want an injury free perfect thing, perfect life, then I should scale my goals down. You know, I think I should just tell myself I'll recreationally run or, you know, whatever else. But if, I, if I'm if i committed to doing uh, what I set out to do, then I have to accept that whatever comes with it, comes with it. You know, you can't have a sore leg keep you from running. You know, or you can't yeah. have, okay, today I don't feel like it, I haven't slept enough, I'm not going to swim in the morning. It, it's very bad overall for consistency. and. Um, so I try. I mean, I don't succeed all the time, but I try very hard to work on that every day. You know, um, and now I have better people who are telling me, who are giving me, you know, newer ideas because your body also changes over time. You know, right? There's, a, there's an element of the sport that is so repetitive that every year you can't keep doing the same damn thing you were doing last year because you know then your performance won't. You know, it, it, well, it might work for two to three years in a row, but the fourth year, you know, your body will change to to adapt to that training load. So you definitely have to be a bit mindful of that and again that's a very individual thing you know there are people that never recover from falls and you know they have all kinds of problems structurally and you know they have uh, issues getting back into the game uh, the mental aspect of the game is, is a secondary thing uh, but but it's also very important um, i don't mean to make fun of sports uh, psychology at all but i think um, yeah i mean my injuries are it's all right i mean it it did put me out of contention but not not destructively so i think I enjoyed the time that I that I needed to take off in, you know, it was great. I, if I hadn't slowed down, I wouldn't have met my husband. I wouldn't have been at Rupa. Mm. I wouldn't have done so many things. I wouldn't have, uh, I don't know, you know, I think it, it depends on you how you perceive it. Sometimes, you know, if your body tells you to back off, you have to back off. There's nothing you can do about it, you know. Exactly. And on this front, we have a couple of questions that come and came in. We have uh, 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 Sri Hari from uh, Los Angeles, and his question is, I have a child's pain uh, whenever I run, I stretch a little bit before and after. Is there anything else I can do to address the problem? Uh, is there something you could throw some light on that front to, to help him uh, out? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? I, didn't I have I have a child's pain whenever I run, I stretch a little bit before and after. Is there anything else I can do to address the problem? Um, I used to have actually pain uh, quite a bit um, and I think rubbing it is very, very, uh, it's very useful, it's been very useful for me. I just use my, my thumb and my forefinger and I, you know, really pinch the back of my leg very hard, you know, for like five to six seconds and, and then release it. And that kind of, and you know, or, or get a massage specifically telling your therapist to work on your, on your heel, but if you're doing this at home yourself, then, you know, uh, Rubbing your Achilles is actually a very good way to release the stress. And I think if, if he's flat-footed, then you know one of the simplest things you can do is probably rub his foot on a ball because that releases the tension from the bottom of the foot and it will make his leg, you know, it will sort of release the pain in his leg and, and in the back of his leg as well. Um, but yeah, I think, I think rubbing his Achilles tendon is, is probably, and heat and ice, again, depending on your composition, is something that I would try as well. So if you can soak his legs in warm water with some salt, maybe at the end of you know, every run or every other run, if he has the time, then yeah, that would be a good thing too. Because you just need to keep your muscles loose, really. That's, that's really all it comes down to. But an Achilles injury, I, you know, unless he's injured, I, you know, this is the best thing that I can recommend. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, my apologies, it should be Achilles uh, pain, right? So, oh. <laughs> my pronunciation is completely slow. Uh, I, I think it's screwed up on the pronunciation here, okay. And then we have Vivek Mandava back again from Seattle, curious about uh, Anu's thoughts on barefoot running and uh, if you have ever uh, tried it out yourself. There's a lot of literature on zero drop and uh, vibrance. I'd like to hear about your take if you have practiced or tried barefoot running. I remember Milka saying running barefoot. Uh, any, any thoughts on that front? 
See, one thing, um, I just want to say that I really love the book Born to Run. I think that is the book that sort of started this whole episode of Barefoot Running in America. But Or, or maybe people knew about it before, but I definitely this book became the scout uh, book and everybody read it and then Adidas started to manufacture these really thin sole uh, shoes, uh, which are not really shoes, they are just covers for your feet. And everybody suddenly running barefoot. Now, I think one thing to keep in mind is that Milka Singh was always running barefoot. A lot of elite marathoners in India were always running barefoot. You know, they have been running barefoot from since they were children or with very thin uh, shoes. You know, we used to call them kids in high school. They're thin canvas shoes, so not, not a lot of sole at the bottom. So I think the thing to keep in mind again is that don't get uh, run over by fads because I think that's the, that's the most dangerous thing that you can do. You know, someone says, um, Atkins diet, then everybody jumps on the Atkins diet. Someone says barefoot running, then everybody jumps on barefoot running. If someone says, you know, do this thing, uh, you know, something only high, high uh, protein and this kind of diet. Then. So I think fads are very, very dangerous. Um, you cannot reverse, you know, 25 or 35 or however old he is, years of uh, musculoskeletal development. And unfortunately, if you read the fine print in that book, he says that, you know, current modern day shoes are bad news, you know, because they do give us too much padding on the under underside of our foot. Therefore, we are biomechanically very unstable. And, uh, you know, when you take that out suddenly after running on these, you know, thick sole shoes for more than so many years or even walking around in them and try to run barefoot, that's really bad news for your foot because it's not going to adjust um, that quickly. You know, and I think unless you do it very gradually and, and you're completely aware of what what aches and pains you have, which in our busy lives, again, is very difficult to do. This is why I don't prescribe training programs, because I also have the luxury of sleeping a lot when I want to sleep a lot, right? right. I, I, can't, I, I cannot stress enough how, how important it is to sleep. You know, if you're training a lot, you, you definitely need to sleep more. Now, how, how do you explain that to a, an average working person? So I think in that way, in barefoot running, I don't know, unless you've been doing it since you were a child, I think it's a pretty dumb idea because it's not something that you can just switch to like that in, in two seconds. You, know, you can't. And uh, you know, build it up. You know, over a year, over two years, do it slowly. But still, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an expert. But in in the little I know, I think it's very I think it's very short-sighted to sort of switch to something just because someone said so. You know, and you cannot reverse your evolution just like that. And if you are doing it, if, you, if it is something that you want to run, you. It just makes you happy or you think this is better for me. Do it, but do it very, very slowly. Build it very, very gradually. You know, so that you know, give your body some time to adjust to it. So that, that's what I say. Sure, I think we have definitely have got the answer here. And uh, I know with the level of determination and commitment, talent, you, have, you could have chosen any sport, maybe or even uh, could have represented Indian Olympics or bringing the focus on sports, and especially for women's sports. Does this thought ever cross your mind? Uh, uh, no, I, I will never probably, I probably will not go to the Olympics because I think um, I'm clear about the fact that I am not a child, you know, I'm not someone who had a childhood dream of you know, holding a gold medal in my hand <laughs> and my PhD in the other hand. I never had such a dream. Most of the time, you know, I was dreaming about books or, you know, that equation that I didn't understand. So I, you know, mostly I am not someone who's driven by, um, external adulation, you know, and I think the Olympics, unfortunately, is something that it's great. I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal, you know, it's all fine and dandy, but in this particular sport, I think it's, it's a little bit different um, when it comes to how you actually get in there. And I think unless there's a very good reason uh, for me to ever give, you know, try my hand at it, and if, if, if the road was completely free of political hurdles, then, you know, maybe I think about it. But at this time, no, I'm not thinking about it. And, and to be very honest, I think um, even the rate, rate of debacle with, uh, with tennis, right? I mean, these are all very rich and powerful players, and yet they still had to go through so much, um, yeah. you know, back and forth with the tennis federation, for God's sake. So I think if yeah. you think about me as opposed to tennis players, you know, one thing I really want everybody to understand is that I am pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things. You know, I'm not, I'm not in a sport that is cricket. I'm not in a sport that is tennis. I'm not in a sport that is, um, you know, any, uh, hockey or, you know, I don't know. And if you think about shooting, you know, if you think about Bindra, I think his, mm -hmm. his biggest thing is that he had his, his whole family back him in a way that he right. didn't, yes, I mean, he was dependent on the association to some extent, but that was not the blood, blood and sweat of his life. You know, it was not to please 
please somebody else you know for the most right. please yes and that's that's what defines his, his you know uh, choices as an athlete now if i start to um, you know think okay at this you know i'm going to do the olympics otherwise my whole en- entire identity is shattered that would be suicidal because i think you know you know what yeah. i'm saying because i have i have uh, but we don't I have just we do have the uh, we do have ultraman and airman in olympics right uh, no no we don't see olympic uh, distance triathlon is about one fourth of what an ironman is uh, but it's a totally different skill set there are some amazing uh, amazingly talented men and women around the world that do olympic distance triathlon who if they ever graduated to ironman would be very super fast no doubt but yeah. i think that um, you know let's let's be realistic you know i think every person is again as i said it, it depends on your motivation and your goals right i mean if you want to finish an ironman versus race an ironman and i have decided i'm going to race ironman now if you ask me about the olympics in triathlon i mean sure it is it is a sport and it, it's very alluring uh, but it at this moment it's not for me so definitely yeah. because the external factors are just way too many to even think about right now exactly exactly and then uh, I won't come to this uh, real uh, we are almost getting close to 1 hour and uh, thank you very much for being patient anu and then quickly go over this uh, dealing with criticism most importantly uh, how what would you say to yourself and uh, when when people try to pull you down or slow you down what 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 how do you deal with that uh, the criticism factor i um I'm like everybody else I feel very bad for a while and then I tell myself all right uh, do these people really matter to me and 99% of the time the answer is no because yeah, I think I already told you the only people that really matter to me are my parents and and of late my husband so I don't really hold myself to the benchmark someone else set you know and yes I mean if people are are mean or they're rude it, it can be very hurtful uh, I definitely know that um, you know words and actions can be very hurtful no doubt but um and have there been people like that sure i mean if you anything you do even if you're trying to be an engineer i'm sure you meet that one yes. crazy professor who says you know you'll never be good at this or you know whatever else, right i mean because they just they, they can't sleep at night without saying that thing so i think um to, to people that are critics or rude people um you know thank god i'm not uh, you know kylie minogue or someone right i mean so i don't really have this much criticism to deal with but i think i'm um I'm just even keen, you know. If I have somebody who tells me you can't do this or blah blah, you know, I, I mostly just I, I don't listen. I start counting backwards from 1,000. That's a very effective trick. So if someone starts to talk crap, just start counting backwards in your head. Exactly. Exactly. You can count out the voice and <laughs> you can do yeah. it. Yeah. True. True. Very true. I know. And. Uh, Uh, just just before closing anu i think i've taken one hour of your time it's, it's awesome and uh, time flies by anu vaidyanathan no doubt is a great inspiration a great role model and um, i've been digging 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 the entire blogs reading about and then trying to get uh, things in, uh, in place compile various questions will there be a movie starring anu playing anu or a movie uh-huh. on anu what do you think <laughs> Um, I hope not because if that happens, I might actually jump out of a window. But yeah, I, I definitely hope not. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that it ever anything I've even considered until now. So thanks a lot. You've made my Sunday evening. But um, as he said, uh, yeah, I, I mean, no, I, I definitely hope not. And, and if, if it does happen, uh, then it won't be Farhan Akhtar playing me. It would be. <laughs> We are not really sure about. It. Oh um, boy, Farhan Akhtar. Okay, okay. and uh, uh, honestly i know it's it's really great uh, having you on our show today and uh, it's, it's it's been such a uh, i think i think months for now uh, you've 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 garnered a lot of support in numerous fans a lot of people saying hey hey can you can you uh, can you try out uh, anu vaidyanath and anna rai samay and then i was like Is it, is it possible really how could, how do i get it and then i went to your facebook page and i saw that you've been active on facebook page and then tried getting some information sending an email and uh, you followed up really uh, as as pleasantly surprised by, by the emails from your team and uh, as well uh, a call from you on that morning when i was sleeping like crazy i don't know what's going on around me i figured i figured it out yeah so fun um yeah so i i I definitely I'm very uh, you know normal that way I I definitely I'm very flattered that people are interested I I definitely think that you know uh, if it is a fun interview then I I do 100 of these no problem 
Um, and, and, and thank you. Thank you for, <laughs> for the interest. You know, that, that is more important to me than, than uh, you know. And positive energy is definitely a great thing. You know, some of the questions uh, you know, that, have, that have come up today, I get a lot of uh, questions on my Facebook page, uh, especially from women. How do you eat? Are you vegetarian? I'm not vegetarian. At the same time, I don't eat a lot of processed meat. I, you know, I eat very, very little meat. I, I eat a lot of fresh food. And, and if I can even say these commonplace things to people and it makes a difference to them, then sure. I mean, I, I'd love to, I'd love to share as much as I can from the time that I get. Absolutely. And uh, to all the listeners around the world who are listening to the show, uh, Anu Vaidinathan uh, is, is on Facebook. And uh, do reach out to Anu on Facebook page. And also, if you have any specific questions that you want to ask, please write back to us on nrisamai at gmail.com. Or you can put, uh, you can post uh, your questions as well on uh, nrisamai's Facebook page. And uh, we'll, uh, do you mind, Anu, if we forward some questions? If we really get back a few questions from our listeners. No problem. No problem. Yeah, I will, I will try to uh, send a send few questions to Anu as well. And uh, Anu, thank you very, very, very much uh, for being on our show today. It's, it's a great thank pleasure and honor to have you on our show today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. See you. Take care. Bye. Well, friends, that was uh, Anu Vaidyanathan. Uh, I think uh, we should call her Jack of All. And, uh, she is an Indian player, the first and only Asian to compete in all I hope uh, you had a uh, really good time listening to her today. So, thank you very much for tuning in today. And uh, uh, I think uh, you all have a fantastic weekend. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, do reach out to NRI Samai uh, on our Facebook page. You can reach out uh, on even Twitter. and. Uh, it's nrisummer at gmail.com if you want to send us a message. Uh, if you have some feedback, please send us to nrisummer at gmail.com. And uh, we hope to bring in uh, the best and brightest and people who contribute to the society back on NRISummer every week, Saturday and Sunday, 9 a.m. PST, Pacific USA time, 9.30 p.m. India time, 12, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So let's tune, tune back friends every week uh, on NRISummer. Thank you very much.
So friends, just to let you know that all our shows are archived on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com forward slash NRS Samai. And our show today with Anu Vaidyanathan will be on YouTube very soon, uh, probably in the next couple of hours. So uh, stay tuned if you wanted to listen to the show or our archives. You can just go to youtube.com forward slash NRS Samai. So this is Srikant Kotella Kota signing off. Anywhere else in the world, uh, all of you, my friends, uh, very warm. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you. See you later. Bye.